Hello, and welcome to Christian Outreach Center's Facebook page. Thank you for being a part of this online experience. We believe God is going to bless you through the message you are about to hear today. Please prepare your hearts and get ready for the ministry of the Word. Our vision continues, expands, and abounds to the glory of God. Good morning, everyone. Hope everybody's having a blessed day. Just want to welcome you to uh, Christian Outreach Center's uh, live Facebook post. Uh, my name is Elder Albert Scott, and uh, I'm going to be, uh, before we get started in the message today, I'm uh, just going to wait a few seconds to give uh, other people a chance to uh, a chance to join. Hope everybody's having, having a uh, blessed weekend. <clears throat> All right. Um, I do want to, uh, while we're waiting, I do want to recognize that uh, this month is anniversary month. So um, basically, uh, we're celebrating 42 years. Uh, so 42 years ago this month, Christian Outreach Center had its first service in 1978. Um, now, I didn't actually join. My mom and I, we were uh, led to join Christian Outreach Center way back in uh, 1982. Back then, I was at the ripe old age of 17 years old. Um, one of the things that uh, that really uh, uh, enfolded us and really grabbed us when it came to uh, joining Christian Outreach Center, one of the things that really captured us was the fact that the pastors always pointed us to Jesus. <clears throat> they always pointed us to Jesus. One of the things I remember Pastor Johnny saying was that uh, he quoted uh, 1 Corinthians 11 and 1. He said, you know, I always follow me as I follow Christ. He said, but this is what he, he said. He actually put a caveat in there. He said, now, if I stop following Christ, you better, better not follow me. <laughs> and the reason it sounds kind of funny, but <clears throat> the reason that uh, that impacted me so much was that, you know, a lot of times there's so many pastors that are um, trying to draw you to their personality and trying to draw you to an individual so much to the point that, you know, if, if they do something wrong, if they fall away, then you know, people that follow them actually follow away as if they were Christ, as if they were Jesus. But our pastors have always pointed us to Christ. They've always wanted us to have a personal relationship with Christ ourselves. And uh, so they've always pointed us to Jesus. They've never pointed us to themselves. So um, just want to say happy anniversary, Pastor Rose, Pastor Jamil. Uh, happy anniversary, Christi Christian Outreach Center. Um, I just want to uh, take the time also to thank Pastor Rose and thank Pastor Jamil for this opportunity uh, to come before you today. I really con considered something highly. I don't take it lightly. And uh, I studied, I prayed, and um, I know that uh, that you pray for me as well, so a lot of you saints. So, um, you know, uh, before we get started, you know me, I always like to start with something funny. So uh, <clears throat> since uh, today I'm gonna actually going to be talking about cast your cares or, uh, or basically talking about uh, not to not worry, um, so uh, I thought this story went along right with that. So a woman accompanied her husband to the doctor's office. Um, after her checkup, the doctor called the wife into his office alone, and he said, <clears throat> your husband is suffering from a very severe case of, uh, of stress disorder. He said, if you don't follow my instructions carefully, your husband will die. Each morning, fix him a healthy breakfast, be pleasant at all times, for lunch, make him a nutritious meal. For dinner, prepare an especially nice meal for him. Don't burden him with chores. Don't discuss your problems with him. It'll only make his stress worse. Do not nag him. Most importantly, you must make love to him regularly. If you can do this for the next 10 months to a year, I think your husband will regain his health completely. So on the way home, the husband asked his wife, what did the doctor say? Oh, she said, he said, you're going to die. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, I don't hear you guys laughing. So but whether you thought that was funny or not, I can't tell. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, as I mentioned, the message today is gonna be uh, Cast Your Cares. And uh, our, um, our uh, scripture is going to be, I'll bring that up. So our message is gonna be Cast Your Cares. <clears throat> And our foundation scripture is going to be 1 Peter 5 and 7. Hopefully you can see that, guys, see that on your screen. 
And uh, <clears throat> so one of the things that God asked to, uh, tells us to do, he doesn't ask us, tells us to do is cast our cares on him. He says, cast your cares on me because I care for you. And the reason he does that is because as humans, we're not built to worry. We're not built to carry burdens. We're not built to carry cares. That's why he said, cast all your cares on me because I care for you. Um, <clears throat> and then the second thing is that worry is actually a sin. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 25, it says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry. Let me say that again. Do not worry. Does that sound like a suggestion? No, he's commanding us, do not worry. And the reason he's telling us not to worry is because worry is the sin, because we just weren't built for it. The Bible says in John 10, 10, it says the thief talking about the devil comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. What's he want to steal, kill, and destroy? He wants to steal, kill, and destroy your dreams, your hopes, your future, your peace, your joy. He wants you to walk around earth just like it's hell on earth. You ever heard somebody say that? Man, I feel like my life is hell on earth. Well, that's what the enemy wants to do. At the end of the day, he can't, he can't, uh, he's not going to show up to you with a red suit on and a pitchfork saying, I got you. You know, he's not going to do that. What he does is he attacks our minds. He bombards our minds with negative thoughts. He says negative people across your path bombard you with negative thoughts, negative negative things so that you can worry. When you uh, when you log on to your social media site, you see all these negative things. When you log on to, when you turn on the news, you see all these negative things. And that's why we have to watch how much CNN we watch. We, we, watch. we have to watch, we have to be careful how much MSNBC we watch. We have to be careful. I'm not saying don't stay informed, but I'm saying that you have to do it in moderation. You have to make sure you watch enough so that you're informed, but not too much to the point that the world starts getting into you, that you start getting depressed, that you start taking on those worries, you start taking on those cares on yourself, and you get to the point where it impacts your life. The reason that's so important is because as Christians, we're supposed to, the Bible says we're supposed to be salt. We're supposed to be light. When people see us, they should see the answer. They should look at us and see us walking around just like it's heaven on earth, not hell on earth. They should, uh, the, the Bible says, Jesus said, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, he wants us walking around. Do you think his people walking around heaven worried? You think his people walking around on heaven saying, oh, no, I don't know what I'm going to do? No, in heaven, it's all good. And that's what God wants us walking around here. And the key is we operate in faith. The Bible says we don't go by what we see, but we go by the unseen. So you're not, you, we're not going by the things that's going on in the world, because guess what? The things that's going on in the world are temporary. They're temporary. And the, the things of God are eternal. So we need to put our faith in the things of God. We need to put our faith. Yeah, I know how things look with the coronavirus. I know how things look with the unemployment going up. I know how things look. Yeah, it looks dire. But we don't go by the things that we see. We go by the things that are unseen. We go by our faith. We have faith in God. We have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So um, we look on that. When you think about that, uh, like what this one guy said, he said, life is 10 percent what happens to you and 90 percent how you react to it. I don't want you to think about that 10 percent what happens to you in 90% how you react to it. Because a lot of times we act the opposite. A lot of times we look at things in the world and we think those things are so real that they're more real than God. And that's just not the truth. God is, is bigger than the problems. He's bigger than the situation that you're going through. God is bigger, but the key is we have to focus on him. We have to focus on God and not the things of the world. I like what Kenneth Hagin said, he said, thoughts are just like birds of the air. He said, I can't stop the birds from flying over my head, but I can't stop them from landing and building a nest. So you can't stop the thoughts from coming, but you can't stop yourself from thinking about it, meditating on it, meditating on it, thinking about it over and over again. You know, when you think about it over and over again, what you're doing is you're making that thing bigger in your sight than it really is. Back in the day, we used to call that making a mountain out of a molehill. So a molehill is something really small, but you keep focusing on it, focusing on it, and you're making it really big. I was talking to this guy one time, and I was telling him, I said, when I was younger, <clears throat> I, need, I didn't have a car, so I needed a ride to work. And so while I was waiting on my ride, I, I called this friend of mine and asked him if he could pick me up or take me to work. And he said, sure, Albert, no problem. So I'm sitting over there waiting on He said, I'll be over there probably in about 10 minutes. I said, okay, great. So I'm waiting on him. Ten, five minutes passed by. Ten minutes passed by. 20 minutes passed by, 30 minutes passed by. I'm like, where is this guy? And so finally he shows up and I'm like, man, where are you being? I've been waiting on you forever. And he said, Albert, he said, I told you I'd be 10 minutes. And sure enough, I looked at my watch and only 10 minutes had passed by. 
So why did I think it was 30 minutes? Well, it's because that's all I was focusing on. I was focusing on so much. I was looking every time a car passed by, I look out the window. Every time I hear, think I hear a car, is that him? Is that him? So I kept looking. And that's where I, that's what we do. We, so, we focus so much on the things that we see that those things get bigger in our eyesight. You know, we have a skewed perception of them in our own eyesight than the reality that there really is. And the reality is God is bigger. God is bigger. I like what the Bible says in Romans 8, 28. It says that we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. So no matter what your situation, no matter what your circumstance, no matter what you're going through right now, God promised in his word, he wrote it down. All things are going to work together for your good. It's going to turn around for your good. And so what you have to do is you have to not focus on the situation or, or circumstance, the thing that's temporary. You have to focus on the fact that it's, that God is going to work, turn it around for my good. God is going to work it out for my good. Yeah, the situation or circumstance that you're going through right now, it might seem hard. The situation or the circumstance that you're going through right now, it might seem more real than God. But the truth is, God is bigger. God is bigger than this situation or circumstance. So what we need to do as Christians, we need to recognize that these are distractions from the enemy. These are distractions. The enemy is trying to steal your joy. You need to recognize that the enemy is trying to steal your peace. The enemy is trying to get you to worry. And it's so amazing to me. I hear some Christians say, you know, if I don't worry about them, I don't, that means I don't love them. If I don't worry about them, that means I don't love them. Or some people say, oh, you know, I just worry. That's just who I am. This, I'm just a worry. I'm just, that's just who I am. Well, you know what? We need to change. The Bible says we're not to be we're, we're not to be like the world. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be different. You know, if, if people are going around and they're hurting and they're traumatized by things that's going on in the world and they don't know what's going on. And they come to us as Christians and they ask us, hey, you know, do you have the answer? And you go, no, I don't know what's going on either. I'm worried just as much as you do. You know, how is that exemplifying Christ? How is that exemplifying the, the, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings? Because while you're on the earth, you're supposed to be billboards for Christ. While you're on the earth, people are supposed to look at you and, and say, maybe you have the answer. They're, they want to they wanna be Christians because they see us going through life with joy. They want to be Christians because they see us going through life with peace. They want to be Christians because they see something different in us. But if there's nothing different, then why would they want to join us? If there's nothing different, why would they want to be Christian? You know, we're supposed to be God's billboards. The Bible says in John 14, 27, Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So God is telling us right there, he's given us his peace. He's given us his peace. So if he's given us his peace, why are you walking around worried? Why are you walking around worried? Well, the reason you're walking around worried is because you haven't cast it on him. You haven't cast it on him. Cast your cares, cast your worries, cast your concerns, cast those grandkids, cast those great grandkids, cast that job, cast the coronavirus, cast all that on him because he cares for you. And, and Bible says in Philippians 4, 7, it says in the peace of God, <laughs> The peace of God, glory to God, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, glory to God, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So the peace of God is going to keep your hearts and minds. So it's not something that you're faking, but you're faking. <laughs> this, this is, you believe in God. You believe in God's word. And then the Bible says in James 1 and 2, my brethren, count it all joy. I, I like this is something that Pastor Jamil shared uh, last Wednesday when he was ministering. My brother, count it all joy when you come into diverse temptations. So what are diverse temptations? Diverse temptations are ordinary temptations, temptations that everybody faces. So it says when, every, when you go through these same temptations that everybody faces, count it all joy. Count it our joy. Why do we count it our joy? We count it our joy because we know God has our back. We count it our joy because we know the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We count it our joy because our trust is not in ourselves. Our trust is not in the world system. Our trust is in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Now, if you don't trust him, then no, you're not going to have that joy. If you don't trust him, you're not going to have that peace. If you're not spending time with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, getting to know him intimately, getting to know him more fully, then you're not going to have that joy. You're not going to have that peace. And so it's so amazing to me that some people that get up in the morning and something bad happens to them, something derogatory happens to them, and they proclaim that whole day. Oh, man, this is going to be a bad day. This is going to be a bad day today. This is going to be, oh, this is going to, oh, I'm not looking forward to this day. Everything bad is going to happen. And it's so amazing to me that Job said in Job 325, it says, what I've always feared has happened to me. What I dreaded has come true. So just like Job did, he said the thing that he feared the most came upon him. Just when you proclaim a bad day that day, guess what? 
You're gonna have a bad day. Why? Because you put faith. You call that. You call that thing in the being. You call that thing. You call. You spoke to your day, and you said, "Day, I want you to be bad." Why would you do that? <laughs> Why would you profess that you want to have a bad day today? If something bad happens, say, you know what, devil? I recognize that as a distraction. I'm going to have a good day today. I don't care what that was, but the rest of my day is going to be awesome. Proclaim your day. Take your day back. Don't let the enemy distract you. Don't make him. Uh, don't let him make you proclaim your day is going to be bad. Take that day back. The Bible says in Proverbs 23 and 7, it says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So as you think in your heart, that's what's going to happen. As you think, if you proclaim that your day is going to be good, that's what's going to happen. But if you proclaim the opposite, guess what? <laughs> what do you think is going to happen? And here's the key right here. The Bible says in Romans 12 and 2, it says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. So what we want to do is we want to get our mind off of the normal way of thinking, off the worldly way of thinking. Stop watching so much MSNBC. Stop watching so, so much Facebook. Think of, transform your mind. Renew your mind with the word of God. Start reading, reading uh, uh, your Bible. Start reading Christian books. Get your mind so watching Christian programming. Get your mind off of what the world says and start focusing on what the word of God says. God, I hear you. God, I believe you. God, I'm going to do your will. I want to do your plan. God, I don't want to worry. I want to walk through this with joy. I want to walk through this with happiness and I don't want to be fake. And then the Bible says in Isaiah 59, 59 and 1, it says, listen, <laughs> listen, listen, Linda, listen. Said the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor is his ear too deaf to hear your call. So when you're going through problems, when you're going through situations and circumstances, what do we do? Pray. <laughs> we pray. We pray. We pray. And God says his arm is not too short and his ear is not too deaf to hear your call. And in 1 John 5 and 14, it says, and this is the confidence, glory to God, that we have in him, that we ask anything. Anything, what is anything? Anything. Here's the key, here's the caveat. According to his will, he hears us. And then 15 verse says, and since we know that he hears us, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. So we ask anything in accordance to his will and accordance to his plan. Yeah, not something that you that you want, some selfish thing, but when we pray and ask according to his will and his plan, you know he's gonna he's gonna bring us out of it. And here's uh, what I like. The Bible says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. God wants to give you rest today. He wants to give you rest from your worry. He wants to give you rest from your concern. God doesn't want you walking around uh, with the stress. And, and it's so amazing because uh, I was reading this one article and it says some people stress so much that it actually impacts their heart and they end up having a heart attack. Some people stress so much that they end up contemplating suicide. God doesn't want us walking around like it's hell on earth. He wants you to cast all your cares, all your burdens, all those things that you think are, so, are too big for him to handle. Cast them on him and watch him show up. Cast it on him and watch him watch him to handle it for you. What's happened is a lot of times we cast our cares, we cast our worries on God, and then after a couple of minutes, we go back and pick them up. <laughs> to go back and say, okay, God, I, I, I know I let you handle it for a little while, but you take it too long. You take it too long to take care of this. So I'm going to pick it up and carry it myself. Ah, uh, cast it on him and then leave it there. Leave it there and then trust God. Trust God that he's going to work it out. Trust God that he's going to work it out. The Bible says, Matthew 11, 30, it says, for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. He doesn't want us walking around burdened. He doesn't want us walking out, walking around worried. He doesn't want us walking around thinking about it, thinking about it, meditating on it, meditating on it over and over and over again, all these bad things that are happening. You know what? Cast your care on him and watch him show up. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 10 and 5, casting down imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity everything to the obedience, every thought to the obedience of Christ. So cast when those negative thoughts come, don't allow yourself to think about it. Cast it down just like those birds. You're not going to allow those birds to make a nest in your hair, in your head. Cast them down. Cast those negative thoughts down. When those negative thoughts come, don't allow yourself to think about it. And then here's the key right here. Think about what you're thinking about. A lot of times you'll be sitting over there and you think, where did that thought come from? Well, it came from the enemy. 
The enemy wants you to he wants you to wear it. The enemy wants you to stress. He wants to steal your joy, your peace, your hope, your future. He wants you to walk through this world, walk through this earth, just like it's hell on earth. He wants you to walk through traumatized. When things happen, he wants you to be traumatized. He wants to take you out. His ultimate desire, he can't be when when you when the enemy looks at, at God, he sees his greatest enemy. And the Bible says you were created in God's image. So every time he sees you, what does he see? A representation of his greatest enemy. And he can't do anything to God. And to tell the truth, he can't do anything to you. But what he does is he tries to attack you and bombard you with negative thoughts. He tries to attack you and bombard you with all these negative thoughts, things that have happened to you. He'll bring up stuff that happened to you back when you were little. When you were in high school, he'll bring up something, you know, and try to bombard you with negative thoughts, try to bombard you with something that, that people that you thought were, were good people, think people you thought were credible, he'll, he'll bombard you with negative thoughts and, and try to bring you down. But what you have to do is that you have to re recognize that that, it's just him trying to bring that thought above. He's trying to bring that thought above the word of God, above the word of God. And when something tries to rise above the word of God, the Bible says, cast it down, cast it down. And then it tells us what to think about. The Bible says in Philippians 4 and 8, finally, brother, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, Think on these things. So what we want to do is we want to focus on whatsoever things are true. If it's true, you know, that's what you want to think about. If it's lovely, that's what you want to think about. If it's of a good report, that's what you want to think about. If it's not, cast it down. If it's not, cast it down. Where did that thought come from? That's not your thought. That's not your thought. Don't receive that. Cast it down. And then the Bible says in Psalm 37 and 4, it says, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So those things, those dreams, those plans, those things that you want to happen, guess what? God wants it to happen too. And guess what? He planted them in your heart so he could bring it to pass. He wants to give you the desires of your heart. But here's the key. We have to line up our will with his will. We have to say, God, I want your plan to happen. God, it's so amazing. A lot of times we want something to happen. And instead of following, instead of trusting and waiting on God, we try to make it happen within ourselves. I like what this one minister said. He said, when you make a blessing, you miss a blessing. And the blessing that you miss is the blessing that you that you miss is greater than the blessing that you made. So what you want to do is you want to focus on the fact that, God, I want to wait on you. I want to wait on your will and your plan. Don't, don't do something like I heard this one sister. She uh, wanted a job, so she lied on the application. And then she came in church the next day praising God because he gave her a job. Uh -uh, that's making a blessing. What, what you want to do is you want to wait on God. You want to be honest. You want to wait on his will and his plan. The Bible says in Luke 12 and 7, it says, but even the very hairs on your head are numbered. And the reason that's so amazing to me is because I've heard people say, you know what, your problems, your situation, those things that, you know, you're going through right now, those are too small for God. God don't care about that. But right here, it says that even the hairs on your head are numbered. Now, for me, I don't wake up in the morning going, OK, that's one. That's two. Oops, I missed one. Go back. Is that two? Nah, to me, something like counting the hairs on my head, that's something that doesn't really matter. But how much more does God care about? If he cares about something to me that doesn't matter, how much more does he care about every aspect of your life? How much more does he care that you get that job that you want to have? How much more does he care that your rent, uh, your mortgage is paid? How much more does he care that your car payment is paid? How much more does he care that you don't get the coronavirus? How much more does he care about every aspect of your life? So God cares about every aspect of your life. But here's the key. We have to line our will up to his will in order to bring his will to pass. We have to know, you know, I just read to you, if we pray according to his will and his plan, he hears us. And since we know he hears us, we know we're going to have the petitions that we desire of him. But the key is lining up our will to his will. You can't make something happen. You have to wait on God. God, I trust you. I trust your plan. Even when it doesn't feel like it, even when it doesn't make sense to me, this doesn't make sense to the world. It doesn't make sense. But guess what? I'm I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to believe you. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, and the Lord, who is the spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. I like this. Uh, and so right there is just telling us the more time we spend to God, the more we're going to be like him, the more we're going to reflect him. I like what this one song said. It said, one day Jesus will call my name. As days go by, I hope I don't stay the same. I want to be so close to him. That it's no big change on that day that Jesus calls my name. 
Now, I'm not saying I want to go home to be with the Lord right now, but what I am saying is that as days go by, we should get closer and closer to him. We should, we should want him more and more. We should hunger and thirst more and more to be like Christ. We should hunger and thirst to be more like him and less of ourselves. And the more we hunger and thirst for him, the more we're going to be like him. When problems and, and cares of this world happen, you know, they're not going to impact us so much. They're not going to impact us. The Bible says in Job 36 and 11, it says, if they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. So right there, we, he's promised us, you know, the closer we get to God, it's not a sin to, 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 uh, to have prosperity. It's not a sin to, to be pleasurable. God wants us to be happy in this life. But here's the key. He wants us to be happy in line with his word. He wants us to be happy in line with his will. He wants us to be happy in line with his plan. We don't want to hoard up riches and, and have fancy cars and then pass by the poor just like nothing happened. You know, he wants us, you know, we're supposed to be conduits. We're supposed to be say, God, give it to us so he can give it through us. You know, we're, we're supposed to want his will and his plan to happen. And then the Bible says in Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know, says the Lord, hallelujah, for I know what I have the plans for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a future and a hope. So God wants to give his ultimate desire. He already has a plan laid out for you to give you a future and a hope. So he wants you to line up with him so he can bring his will to pass. He wants that. He wants you to have a will and a hope. He wants you to be prosperous. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to walk, walk around on this earth just like it's heaven on earth. He don't want you walking around on earth. And I'm not saying, notice I said, you know, God wants you to be happy. He wants you to be prosperous. But I'm not saying that no problem, nothing bad will ever happen to you. I'm never saying you're not going to have any problems. That is not what I'm saying. <clears throat> the Bible says in Psalms 34 and 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But, you always got to watch out for the but, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. So, yeah, we're going to have problems. Things are going to happen. Things are, that are uh, going to be bad are going to happen. We're in, a, we're in a world that's falling. So bad things are going to happen. We're not on earth yet. We, I mean, on heaven yet. We're, we haven't made it there yet. So while we're on earth, Things are going to happen. Bad things are going to happen because God gave man a free will and man chose to, with his free will to sin. Man chose choose to do bad things with his free will. So bad things are going to happen, but he promised us that he's going to deliver us out of them all. And then the Bible says in John 16, 33, here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. So if Jesus overcame the world, what does that make us? overcomers. Yes, you're overcomers. So he's already said you're going to overcome every problem. You're already going to, you're already going to overcome every circumstance as long as we line our, our will to his will. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says the temptations in your life are no different. The temptations in your life are no different. So everybody, the things that you're going through, the things that you're so traumatized about, the things that you're thinking, nobody has gone through something like I've gone through. And nobody feels the hurt that I feel. Nobody feels the pain like I feel. Guess what? The Bible says the temptations that in your life that you're going through are no different from what others experience. But God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure it. So yeah, the temptation that you're going through right now, it may seem horrendous, it may seem painful, and, and it is painful. <laughs> but here's the key right here. We have to know that God is going to bring us out. God is going to turn us around, turn it around. Romans 8, 28, and we know, you have to know that all things, you have to know it. You have to know it in your knower that all things are going to turn around for your good. You have to know it. You have to trust in God and say, God, I know what I'm going through seems bad. God, I know what I'm going through and I don't see a way out, but God, I'm trusting you. Because you said in your word, all things are going to turn around for my good. That was this one particular time. Uh, before I do that, I want to share one more scripture. Uh, Psalms 23, 4. It says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And here's the key right here. He said, David said, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He didn't say, I'm staying in the valley of the shadow of death. He didn't say, The valley of the shadow of death is surrounding me. I don't see a way out. He said, Yea, though I go through 
the valley of the shadow of death. So you have to see yourself going through the pain. You have to see yourself on the other side. You have to see yourself going through. When I had my lung transplant, I didn't focus on the fact that all the, all the pain that I was going through. I didn't focus on all the coughing and everything that was happening to me, but I saw myself on the other side. I saw myself running. I saw myself jogging. I saw myself exercising. I saw myself before you ministering the word of God. I saw myself on the other side. And that's what you have to do. You can't focus on the fact, on the pain that's going through. You can't focus on the situation or circumstances circumstances happening right now, you have to see yourself on the other side. When you see yourself on the other side, then you won't focus on what the enemy is trying to distract you from. You can go through it with joy. You can count it out joy. You can count it. You can go through it with peace. You can go through it. You can go through it on, with trusting in God. So this one particular time, my wife, Beverly, uh, Beverly Scott, she uh, was uh, going on a uh, training mission at her job. So she was going to Chicago. She flew out there and uh, she got in a cab and she was driving, riding a cab to a hotel and something happened on the way to a hotel. Uh, a van came in behind her. All the traffic was stopped because it was rush hour and a van came behind, behind her and just bam, smashed into the back of her cab. And when it smashed into the back of her cab, she was really injured, really, really bad. And so uh, a couple of hours later, I got a phone call from the hospital and they said, Mr. Scott, your wife's been in an accident. She's not responding. And we're asking the family to come out. Now, we had prayed that morning before she even got on the plane. So when she told, when the lady told me that, I had a choice right then. I had a choice to look at the natural. I had a choice to hear the words that she said, or I had a choice to believe the God. I had a choice to believe that we the, the prayers that have gone forth that morning. And so and instead, I chose instead of instead of believing the, the nurse on the phone, I chose to believe God. Instead of believing the circumstance, I chose to believe God. And it was amazing. It was so funny when she, she told me that she said, we're asking the family to come out. And I said, OK. And I said it so cheerfully. She said, you know, she was thinking to herself, he must not have heard what I said. And so she repeated herself. She said, Mr. Scott, your wife's been in an accident. She's not responding. We're not able to wake her. And we're asking the family to come out. And so I repeated myself. I said, oh, okay, thank you. And so I hung up the phone from talking to her. And then, then I just said, God, I know <laughs> what we prayed this morning. I know this is not it for Beverly. I know that you said in your word with long life, would you satisfy her and show her your salvation? I praise you and thank you, Lord God, that this will be a testimony. And so um, I called the church. I called uh, Lois and I told Lois, I said, Lois, I said, I need you to get the saints on the phone and tell them to start praying. And so in the meanwhile, I was trying to get in touch with my daughter because I didn't want to, I wanted to share with my daughter in faith because I didn't want her to hear from somebody else. Anyway, long story short, I uh, made it back home later that night. Um, I met up with my daughter and I got a phone call from the hospital. And they said, Mr. Scott, your wife is conscious. She's responding to commands. And we're greatly encouraged. Look at God. Look at God. And you know, it was amazing when they said that uh, that my wife, your wife is conscious and she's responding to command. I want to ask them, she's responding to commands. Are you sure that's my wife? But uh, anyway, long story short, a couple of months later, we were able to stand before the congregation and give the testimony about the goodness of God. And the Bible says in Romans 8 28, all things. All things will work together for good. And then the, the scripture that I was holding on to during that whole time was Psalms 118, 17. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. So she did not die, but lived and declared the works of the Lord. So what the devil meant for evil, <laughs> God turned it around. God turned it around. And just like the Bible says that God is not a respecter of persons. What he turned around for me and Beverly, he can turn around for you. He, he's not a respecter of persons. What he turned around for Beverly, he'll turn around for you. The Bible says in Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon. <laughs> Didn't say it would be formed, but no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Any And every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment, shall you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the service of the Lord and the righteousness is of me, said the Lord. So it didn't say the weapon wouldn't be formed. Didn't say it wasn't going to come like a distraction, but it said it will not prosper. And so you need to hold on to that. Yeah, the, the, it looks, the situation, the circumstance looks bad, but guess what? 
It's not going to prosper. It's not going to prosper. And you need to hold on to that. The Bible says in James 1 and 2, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Now, I like what it says about that. Consider it an opportunity. So it's an opportunity for you. you. You have an opportunity to consider it a great joy when problems and circumstances come your way. You have an opportunity to consider it a great joy. You have an opportunity to trust God. So what are you going to do? So what are you going to do? I like what Deuteronomy 20 and 19, it says, I've called heaven and earth before you, to, and, and, and I've set before you life and death, blessings and curses. And then he gives us the answer. He says, choose life that both you and your seed may live. So you have an opportunity right there to choose life or death, blessings or cursing. You have an opportunity. So what are you going to do? Are you going to trust God? Are you going to believe the situation or circumstance? Are you going to say, God, I believe you. God, I, I'm going through this with joy. God, I'm going through this with your peace because your peace that you gave to me, the peace, the joy that you gave, the world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away. Praise God. You need to make up in your mind. You're going to go through this with peace. You need to make up in your mind. You're going to go through this with joy. I was watching this movie the other night, and it was called I Still Believe. And uh, in this movie, the character and his wife had gone through some horrendous things. And after they went through it, they actually made up, the guy made a song called I Still Believe. And he, he used that as a testimony to share with people all over the world. And they even, like I said, they even made a movie about it. So when you're going through situations and circumstances, yeah, God didn't cause it. God didn't make it happen. But God can cause great things to happen because of it. So even though they went through some horrendous things, they were able to make a movie about it and testify and, and to, uh, around the entire world about the goodness of God, about their trust in God. So while you're going through something, a situation, a circumstance, instead of asking, God, why is this happening to me? God, why am I going through this? Say, God, you said in your word that all things work together for my good. God, you said in your word that it was going to work out, that, I, that even though I'm going through this, God, hallelujah, you're going to bring me out. You're going to bring me on the other side. Yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, <laughs> I'm going through it. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. And the Bible says in Romans 8.35, who shall separate us? From the love of God. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, 36 verse, as it is written. Just one second, I'm sorry. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. And in that 37th verse, here's the key right here. Nay, in other words, no, nothing's going to separate us. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ that loved us. So yeah, no matter what situation or circumstance that you're going through, even though it was created to, make, to bring you away from the will of God, even though it was created to draw you from God, even though it was created to get your eyes off of God, you can make up in your mind, nay, and all these things. In all these things, I'm more than a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm more than the coronavirus. I'm more than the unemployment rate. I'm more because the greater one lives inside of me. You need to recognize that God is greater than the situation or circumstance. And guess what? He lives, takes up residence inside of you. So you need to recognize that you have the greater one inside of you. You're more than a conqueror. You can do all things through Christ. Amen. Praise God. So I want to share this story. When I was a, a teenager, uh, uh, I was uh, I started call, working at you know what I call back then a real job. I worked at Six Flags before then, so I started working at this company called Winn Dixie, and it was a grocery store. So when I started working there, the manager had me doing everything. I mean, he had me scrubbing floors outside, and he had me working cleaning up grease in the deli bakery, and had me doing a little of everything. And so when he had me doing it, I started complaining to uh, people at church. I was like, he's got me doing everything, and, and you know, he's rubbing me, you know, he's not treating me right, and not, you know, and I started complaining and, and everything, and, and so they encouraged me. So a lot of times when you're going through things, you need to, we t we're tempted to go around people that will pat us on the back. We're tempted to go around people that echo what we're saying. You know, they say, yeah, that's right. You're right. But I'm so glad at Christian Outreach Center that saints will tell the truth. I'm so glad that we, that, that we have people that, you know, regardless of, of how we feel, we want to have a little pity party, they'll tell the truth. So they shared the scripture with me. They shared Philippians 2 and 14. It says, do everything without complaining and arguing. <laughs> I didn't want to hear that. I wanted somebody, I was like, woe is me, and I want somebody to, to, to caress me and tell me, yeah, yeah, but you're right. You're right. They're treating you bad. You're right. But instead, they, they quote, quote a scripture to me. Do everything without complaining and arguing. 
And then this is the one right here that they that really got me, that really shot me. Zechariah 4.10a. It says, do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. They told me, Albert, they said, right now, what you're doing, don't despise the, the small beginnings. They said, because how you do right now is how you're going to do in the future. How you do right now is going to be your, your destiny. How you're going to be when you get big. If, you, if you're faithful right now in the, in the small things, God's going to promote you to something big. But you got to be faithful. You got to do it without griping and complaining. You got to be faithful. You got to do it with the joy of the Lord. I didn't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. I want somebody to tell me, yeah, he is mistreating you. I would I would report him to the labor board. You got to go over his head. You know, I wanted somebody to caress me and tell me I was right. I don't want somebody to give me the word. But that's what we need, saints. We need somebody to give us the word of God. We need somebody that's not going to caress us, but we need somebody to tell us the truth. And so that's what happened as a result of that. The Bible says, uh, 2 Corinthians 10 and 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. So, yeah, so even though you might be mistreated, even though those people might be treating you wrong, you don't react in kind. You don't react in kind. That's not how we do. When somebody does us wrong, then we react in love. We react in love because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that's been given unto us. So when, when so whatever kind of fruit you have inside of you, that's what's going to come out. So if you have the fruit of love, of joy, of peace, and somebody pushes you, somebody squeezes you, somebody squeezes your fruit, love should come out. If you got something else in there, something else is going to come out. Now, I'm not talking about Christian Outreach Center. Of course, we all operate in love. I'm talking about the church down the street. Okay. So the Bible says in Matthew 5.44, it says, But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Now, 45th verse says, In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives sunlight to both the evil and the good. And he sends rain to the just and the unjust. Mm. And the 46th verse says, if you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? Even the corrupt co collect, tax collectors do that much. And the 47th verse says, if you're kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even the pagans do that. So if, we're, if we love and we're kind only to those that we like, <laughs> What's the difference? How are we follow the Christ? How are we God-like? We're supposed to love and be kind to those, even though, especially those that do us wrong, especially those that we don't agree with. We're supposed to be kind because how are they gonna? How are they gonna want change if they don't see it in us? How are they gonna? How are they gonna see the love of Christ if we're not showing it? We need to display the true fruit. Romans 12, 12 and eighteen says, "Dear friends, never take revenge." Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. So here's the key right here. I, I took my sisters up on, on what they said. When they gave me the word, I operated in it. I started operating in love. I started going to work whistling. I would, you know, they even to the point when, when my boss at, at Winn-Dixie had limited my hours. He, they, he uh, drew my hours all the way back. To, I was working 20 hours every two weeks. So in other words, I was working two hours a day. And guess what those two hours consisted of? Uh, two hours at the end of the day, he would have me go back at 10 o'clock at night every every weekday, and I would clean out grease and grime out of the deli bakery, all the grease and all the syrup. I, I would have bleach and cleaning that out every day. And guess what? I was doing it with the joy of the Lord. I was doing it with the joy of the Lord is my strength. So I was going, I was doing it joyful. I was doing it happy. And I was doing it, I wasn't doing it for him. I was doing it because, because God, God told me to be a true child of the king. If I wanted to be a true child of the king, I had to be that example on this earth. Was it easy? No, it wasn't easy. Cleaning up grease and grime, you know, but I had to change my attitude. I had to change the way I thought about it. I had to change the way I approached it. And when I changed the way I approached it, guess what? Somebody saw it, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so God promoted me out of that job and he promoted me into a job where I was working full time. At the time I was working, five, I was making five dollars an hour. He almost doubled what I was making back in 1982. That was a lot. OK, but he almost doubled what I was making. I enjoyed doing it. I was working with Christians. I mean, all because I changed the way I reacted, all because I displayed the love of God. Now, here's the key right here. I just read to you where God said revenge is, my, is mine. And then Hebrews 10.31 says, 
it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So when you were operating, were you reacting out of the love of God and you leaving revenge up to God? Guess whose hands they fall into? Guess whose hands they fall into? And so my boss, I was mistreating everybody. He was mistreating other co-workers. He was uh, doing things that were un unseemly. Guess what happened? His boss came in. Now, I couldn't have situated this. I couldn't have orchestrated this. You know, I couldn't have put these things. You know, I was just working as a, as a, a $5 an hour employee. But God came in and changed things around. So his boss came in, saw how he was treating his employees and demoted him. Went and sent him to a smaller store where he had he had he eventually ended up leaving the company. But God turned God did this. God revenge. I didn't do it. I didn't orchestrate it. I was showing love. I was praying. I was praying for him. You know, I was I was displaying love. And so as a result of how I reacted, as a result of me displaying the love of God, in in spite of the situation I was going through. God turned the thing around and God avenged me, even though, even though, and I could, I could share multiple stories of how I trusted God and God was able to avenge, God was able to turn things around. So uh, my question to you is, is have, do you have somebody in your life like that? Somebody that seemed like they were created just to make you mad, just to tick you off. They were created, it seemed like every time you see them, just, oh, <laughs> just like, you know, I'm not going to say you hate seeing them because it's Christian. We don't hate, right? Right? Okay. <laughs> but what happens is you have to make up in your mind, how are you going to do, how are you going to uh, come to that person? Are you going to display the love of God? Because here's the key right here. Every time you go around that person, the God that sent that person across your path, make no mistake about it. The enemy is the one that sends those distractions. But God wants to see how you're going to operate because that's a test. God wants to see how you're going to are you going to pass your test. And here's the key right here. When we go through tests, when we go through trials and situations. God wants to see us pass that test. And just like in school, if you don't pass that test, what happens? You got to take it again. So you sit over here going, you know what? I'm going to uh, this person is too much. I don't want to deal with them no more. I'm going to go to another job and you go to another job and run into another person just like that. Or worse, that person follow you around. <laughs> so here's the key. Let's decide we're going to operate in the love of God. Let's decide we're not going to follow our emotions. God, I'm going to follow your will. I'm not going to ignore my emotions. I'm not going to react out of my emotions. But God, I'm going to react out of love. I'm going to be that example. Here's the key right here. At the end of the day, you know, if you, uh, if you react ungodly, if you react out of your emotions, if you react out of your flesh, one day, someday is going to come where God's going to say, you know what? I want you to witness to that person. I want you to tell that person about me. How much credibility do you think you'll have when you come to that person and try to tell them about Christ and you've had all this animosity with them all that time? I was talking to my mom the other day and she was telling me that uh, she had actually uh, working at this job. And she said while she was working there, everybody knew she was a Christian. And she said that uh, this one person, I think his name was John, said John used to just talk about her, belittle her all the time, belittle her relationship with Christ. I can't believe you're a Christian. And in the 21st, 20th century, you're a Christian and you're trying to you uh, trying to believe in this fairy tale about God. You just belittle her all the time. And you know what she did? She operated out of love. She operated out of love. She still smiled at him. She still wished him a, a good day and everything. So fast forward a couple of years later, John was diagnosed with a uh, with illness and it was terminal. And so she went to visit John because you know that's the way my mom is. And when she went to visit John, he wasn't doing too good. You could tell he wasn't too much longer. And so my mom took the bold step. She said, John, she said, do you want to know? Do you want to uh, know a personal relationship with Christ? Do you want me to introduce you to Jesus? And tears streamed down John's face. And John said, yes. So before he left this earth, she was able to lead John to the Lord. Now, what about your enemy? What about that person that was designed just to tick you off? That person that was designed just to make you mad? Is it worth getting them back? Is it worth getting them, giving them a piece of your mind that they go to hell? Is it worth it? Or do you want to show them the love of God? Do you want to love your enemies? Do you want to pray for them? Do you want to do God's will? Now, if you've done that in the past, if you've sinned in the past, if you've in the past, if you've given them peace of your mind, the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. So I'm not saying this for you to feel condemned, but here's the key. The Bible says in 1 John 1 and 9, it says if we confess our sins to him, 
that he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you said something, if you've done anything wrong, just repent. You no, know, like uh, Elder Carey say, no strain on the brain. Just repent. Just repent and ask God for forgiveness and then move on. Just restore that relationship. Move on. Bible says in John 1 and 3, it says, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow for when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. I was, uh, I was uh, the other day, I'm a pretty good cook, but the other day I was making some cornbread. I do not know what happened. I don't know if I had the fire up too high or whatever, but I, when I took the cornbread out, it looked perfect. But then after about five minutes, the cornbread just, just fell in the middle. I mean, it was just, I had to throw it out. It was terrible. And see, here's the key right here. A lot of times God has us in the fire. He has us being tested. And he wants, he doesn't want to take us out until we're ready. He doesn't want to take us out until, until we've been purified, until we're ready to come out, until we're, we're that perfect, that not perfect, but but that mature person to that to and, and a lot of times we want God to take us out early. God, this fire is too hot. God, what I'm going through right now is too hot. It's hot and I want you to take me out. But if God takes us out, we're gonna fail. If God takes us out, we're gonna drop. So God wants us to stay in there until, our, until, until we get mature. He wants our faith to be, to be tested until we get to, to the point that we're mature. So you're asking God to move you out, and he wants you to develop your faith. The Bible says in Psalms 27, 14, it says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Amen. So uh, Pastor Rose, a, a, a lot of you know this story, but I want to share for any, any ones that's, uh, that's visiting. With Pastor Rose, um, one of the things that, that uh, you know, her and Pastor Johnny were married. They got married um, in 1965. And so they were married for 36 years. So that's a long time to be married. And I believe God that me and my wife will get there and, and hopefully surpass it one day. But uh, needless to say, you know, Pastor Johnny and Pastor Rose were in love. You know, they were soulmates. They were married for 36 years. You, and you don't get to, you know, 36 years without loving somebody. You don't get to 36 years without having an intimate relationship with someone. So they were married for 36 years. And then in 2001, Pastor Johnny went home to be with the Lord. And it was a devastating time for Pastor Rose and the church. I mean, Pastor Johnny was someone that, uh, like I said, he, he was charismatic, but he was also a trusted father for a lot of us. And, uh, and so when it happened, it was devastating. And so uh, uh, we didn't know, you know what was going to happen. Um, so he, we, we, uh, uh, he went home to be with the Lord and they put, put him in the ground. I believe it was that Friday. And then we're all surprised uh, Sunday morning, Pastor Rose was in the pulpit. <laughs> we were like, Pastor Rose is in the pulpit. There she was in the pulpit, preaching and ministering and and and, uh, and encouraging us through our hurt. She said, "I know you lost the pastor," and and she was just. It was almost as if you know she was she was uh, exuberating the joy of the Lord. She was and and she was just you know encouraging us and telling us you know I know the pastor's gone but we're gonna be okay. The vision is gonna continue, expand, and abound to the glory of God and. That's amazing to me because something that anyone else would have devastated, something anyone else that would have took them out. Here she was that Sunday encouraging, encouraging us, <laughs> admonishing us. And so here's, here's uh, amazing to me. You know, when I see Pastor Rose and I see how she reacted, like I said at the beginning of my message, you know, life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you reacted. She chose to react out of the love of God. She chose to choose God. And I've seen uh, I've seen the opposite. I've seen people where they had a family member that went that passed away that, that went home to be with the Lord, and it devastated them. They stopped going to church. They stopped seeing friends. They stopped doing everything. And and the part here is that, that I want you to focus on is that you know we both have a, we all have a relationship with God. We all have an opportunity to have a relationship with God. We all have an opportunity to trust God in everything, for everything, and with everything. We all have that opportunity. The Bible says in Romans 8, 11, there is for now, now no condemnation. So once again, once again, I don't want to condemn you, you know, if you haven't done this. But here's the key right here. Don't trust God just when it's convenient. Don't wait for problems to happen. Trust God now. Spend time with God now. 
Say, God, I trust you now. God, I want a more deeper relationship with you now. I don't want to wait till problems and circumstances happen. Yeah, he can He can be with you and he can bring you out. But if you have yourself built up, just like Pastor Rose was, if you already have yourself built up in the word of God, if you already have your relationship with God strong, when problems and situations and circumstances happen, just like Pastor Rose, you can count it all joy. You can count it all joy. Yeah, I know the problem with circumstance seems dire, but I'm counting it all, all joy. God, I'm trusting in you. Regardless of the situation or circumstance, I'm trusting in you. And so that's the key right there. We want to count it all joy. We want to trust God. And we want to cast all of our worries, all our concerns, all on him because he cares for us. Amen. So uh, before I end my, my, my uh, uh, presentation here, I just want to pray for you. There could be some of you out there that are experiencing some pain, that are ex experiencing some heartaches right now. There's a lot of things going on in the world. There's a lot of un uncertainty. So I just want to pray with you right now. So everybody, just if you would, just stretch out your hands and just uh, just let me pray with me. Uh, pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, you said in your word, Father, that to cast all of our cares on you because you care for us. Father, we praise you and thank you, Lord God, because of because of your goodness. We praise you and thank you, Father, for your word. Father, we cast all our cares on you at this time. Father, all the hurts, all the pains, all our kids, all of our grandkids, we cast all of them on you, Lord God. We cast our parents on you, Lord. Father, knowing that you care for us, Father. And Father, from this day forward, we'll not pick it up again, Lord. We'll not pick it up, but we'll trust you, Lord God. And Father, we'll be examples of you, Lord Jesus. We'll be that salt. We'll be that light, Father God. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, we'll give you the glory and honor and praise. Thank you, Father, for your word, because you said that you will be a comfort, Lord God, to those that are in pain. Father, comfort those, Lord God, that are hurting. Comfort those, Father, that have lost loved ones. Comfort those, Lord, that have gotten negative doctor's reports. Comfort them, Lord God. Yes, they've lost their job. Comfort them, Lord God. Hallelujah. Oh, Father, we praise you and thank you. Hallelujah. For your word coming to pass in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, for adventure, there are some of you out there that are listening to this uh, to this message and you don't currently have a personal relationship with Christ. I just want to encourage you. The Bible says in, in Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says, if, if we confess with, the, with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we'd be saved. So the key, God didn't, didn't make it hard. You know, he's going to have to climb on our knees, you know, for a mile on broken glass. We don't have to do all of these things. All we have to do is just confess the worship of Jesus. So if you're out there and you want to pray and you want to have a person, you've never had a personal relationship with Christ, but you want to right now. Say, Brother Albert, I've never had a personal relationship with Christ. But uh, but after the message today, I want to have that relationship. I want to have I want to have that peace. I want to have that joy that you talked about. If you're out there, I just want to pray with you today. And then my second invitation, if you're out there and you say, Brother Albert, I've, I've had a relationship with Christ, but I'm not as close as I used to be. I've walked away. Problems have happened. Things have happened in my life. And I'll be honest with you. I blame God for him. I blame God for him. Instead of drawing closer to God, I blamed him for him. But after your message today, I want to have a relationship with Christ. I want to come back to him. So if you're out there, the Bible says in, in 1 John 1 and 9, it says, if we confess our sins, our slips, our misses, our mistakes, if we confess them to him, that he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, but not only to forgive us of our sins, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God's ultimate desire is that we have a right relationship with him. His ultimate desire, he doesn't want to, he don't want to remind you about your mistakes. He doesn't remind you about the things that you've done wrong. He doesn't, you know, and guess what? Your mistake, your sin doesn't surprise him. He doesn't surprise him. It's not too big for him to forgive. His ultimate desire is to have a right relationship with, with you. His ultimate desire is to love you. The Bible says that, that Jesus came, John 3, 7, 3, 16, he says that he sent Jesus into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So his ultimate desire is that you come back to him. So if you're out there and you say, Brother Albert, I want to pray with you. I just want you to repeat this prayer with me. And I want you to repeat it out loud. Let the world know. Let the devil know. Just repeat after me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you. You said in your word, if I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, that I will be saved. Father, come in, take control of my life, take control of my heart. The second invitation, say, dear Lord Jesus, you said in your word, 
If I confess my sins, you're faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Father, I receive your forgiveness now. And Lord, I forgive myself in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Well, the Bible says that there's more rejoicing in heaven over the one repentant sinner than the 99 that needs no repentance. So I'm praising God right now that uh, that you're in the right fellowship with God. And I know the saints on, uh, on live are also praising God with you. So uh, I do have a couple of announcements uh, before I let you go. Um, <clears throat> First of all, uh, you do not want to miss a uh, Wednesday night service. We have our own Elder Terry Career that's going to be coming, bringing the word. It's going to be an exciting word, a right, an end time word, and uh, I know you're going to be blessed. Um, also, I want to congratulate Deacon uh, LaRue and, and uh, Minister Andrea McKee. Their first grandson, Gavin LaRue McKee, graduated from Denison High School last night. So congratulations, the McKees. And, uh, and then uh, I know some of you out there that... Uh, you may, you, may, you may have some extra time on your hand during the quarantine. So I just want to uh, admonish you. Uh, one of the, the uh, readings that we have is the uh, adult student guide. So uh, if you, uh, you can get this from the CLC's bookstore. Uh, it's awesome Bible study. And we're all pastors encourage each member to do this. Uh, so I know everybody has the latest version already. And then uh, awesome book by our own sister pastor, Pastor Jamil King, The Blueprint for Life. So it's awesome word. Uh, make sure you get that and get some of the knowledge that uh, Pastor uh, Pastor Jamil has. Uh, I really encourage you to read that. And then uh, Dr. Eloise shared this uh, on uh, Wednesday and Thursday, and this is her book, uh, I Health Prescriptions for the Soul. So uh, another awesome book. So get a copy of this, uh, especially, you know, go ahead and prepare yourself now before sickness and disease tries to attack you so you know how to combat it. Amen. And then one of the things I talked a lot about the mind, one of the things that I like is uh, Joyce Meyer's book, The Battlefield of the Mind. Uh, you can get this on Amazon. The other books you can get it from my bookstore. The Dr. Eloise book, you can get that from Amazon as well. But The Battlefield of the Mind, really uh, an, an encouraging book, encourages you to cast down those vain imaginations and encourages you to think about what you think about. Amen. So please stay tuned for an important message from, uh, from our announcer. Thank you guys. You have a blessed day. Really appreciate the time today. If you have a prayer request, please log on to www.christianoutreachcenter.org. Select connect from the drop down menu on the right and enter your information. Luke 6 and 38 encourages us to give. If you would like to sow into our ministry, please log on to www dot christian outreach center dot org and from the drop down menu on the right please select give in order to give by text type the word winner that's w-i-n-n-e-r to 73256 let's type the word winner to 73256 our vision continues expands and abounds to the glory of God. Thank you for tuning in. We know you were blessed by the word that went forth today.